Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on uh, what to expect during construction of your dream home. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for your time. Um, I'm Michelle and I'm an executive assistant at TQ Construction. I'll be assisting Megan, our presenter here during this webinar. Just a few things to uh, note before we start again. Uh, a recorded version will be available and provided to you in a follow-up email in the next day or two. So look that up, look for that email. Uh, to respect our presenter, Megan, and all other attendees, we hope to ask all of you be uh, muted and stay muted during the webinar. We will have a Q&A at the end of our webinar. So feel free to ask questions at the end. Uh, or, you know, prepare your questions at the chat box, uh, chat little area down below, <laughs> and Megan will be happy to answer them at the end of our webinar. So now I'm happy to introduce to you officially uh, TQ's Project Relations, Megan. Thanks, Michelle. I'm just going to get the, uh, I think I have the ability to share my screen. So just give me one second here. Mm -hmm. I hope everybody's having a good week so far. Um, so yeah, like Michelle said, uh, today we're going to go over some things to expect during the construction of your dream home. Uh, it's, it's really just kind of like a brief overview sort of situation um, to get an idea. And like Michelle mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat um, or make note of them. And then we can kind of go through them at the end of the webinar. So the goal is to kind of uh, take about 20 minutes to go through the webinar itself. And then there's usually about five to 10 minutes worth of questions kind of at the end, give or take. It's a, it's a flexible sort of time frame. Um, but also if you have like larger questions, that are a little bit more involved that fall outside of the scope of today's webinar. We're really more than happy to have a consultation with you outside of this webinar um, that is complimentary as well to kind of dive into a specific need. So this is uh, the kind of the topics that we're going to briefly kind of go through today. So it's really just a walkthrough of what construction should generally look like. Different contractors might have slightly different ways of handling certain aspects or certain stages, but it's just kind of a general like touch base of what what the process kind of looks like. Because um, other than the image that a lot of people have in their head of just, you know, people using their hammers and smashing against stuff, sometimes people aren't fully aware of what's all included in that entire process. The first thing that happens in construction is you hand off the project to construction. So that what's included in that is confirming your scope. So the way we handle it is we have a meeting on site to walk through everything that's a part of the scope, anything that is specific to the project that needs to be considered um, is brought to light of like, hey, we need to be really considerate of these things. Um, maybe the next door neighbors have kids and, you know, we need to make sure that everything is safe for them or anything along those lines. Um, also confirming any kind of site access. How are we going to get things onto site? Where are we going to store things on site? How are we going to get things off of site? Um, and any kind of like site specific concerns. So that might be anything to do with like geological conditions of the site. It could be um, things that need to be kept um, through demolition. Uh, it might be um, it, it, different between like a renovation versus uh, a new home. So like in a renovation, you might have the homeowners living in the home while you're doing the renovation. So these are all things that need to be considered um, when you're doing that handoff and making sure that the entire team is on the same page from all of the information that's been gathered and, and shared up until that point and then passing it off to construction so that they're not just kind of like plopped onto a site with no understanding. Um, and as a client or as the person who's having the renovation or new home built, you should expect to be a part of that process um, because you are integral to that. This is your home. This is your project. So you should definitely be in the loop of that process. Uh, the next thing that will happen is any kind of like site prep and protection. So in a renovation, that might mean 
um, protecting certain areas of a home that aren't supposed to be getting renovated, like in this picture where it shows that there's dust proofing that's currently open. Um, and you can also see how there is actually some uh, floor protection as well to protect the existing carpet. So things like that would definitely be considered like protection. Other things might be in a new home where you would see like fencing go up around a property to kind of make sure that everything is contained. Uh, bins might start showing up, things like that. And then again, just making sure that like things that are supposed to be salvaged are properly like taped off or moved aside um, and things like that. And then you'll start seeing like materials and tools start getting delivered. Like people will start showing up and it's very much like the getting ready to do stuff stage. Uh, and then the next thing that would kind of come after that is like demo and hazmat remediation. So hazmat stands for hazardous materials. So typically in most construction uh, across the board, the hazardous materials remediation report is done reasonably soon before construction starts because they actually expire uh, due to just, you know, shady history in construction. Um, you need a clean hazmat report in order to get rid of certain materials that are known for containing hazardous materials, such as like drywall and asbestos. Uh, and then also like some exteriors will have lead paint depending on the age of it. So those things that are like red flagged, you need to have a clean report in order to be able to get rid of them at a facility. And if you don't have that clean report, then you're kind of out of luck and you have to get that clean report or you have to have it remediated. And so historically, um, some contractors would reuse the same clean report. So now the municipalities require that they be within a certain age and it depends on the municipality. Uh, I think Vancouver is the shortest. Um, they, I believe they're around 30 days. And then I think everywhere else is somewhere between like three to six months. The thing about hazardous materials is that they all get trucked out of the province. So they are rather costly to deal with and quite a big deal to deal with because you have to have all of your safety equipment as well. You have to have your respirators and your fancy suits and things need to be tended off properly and all of that stuff, uh, which kind of leads into your remediation plan. And then after everything that is hazardous material has been dealt with, you move into your clean demolition. So that can be like, you know, removing cabinetry or carpet, things like that, and then dealing with the appropriate material disposal. So whether it's, you know, recycling as much as you can, whether it's like repurposing old appliances um, or having certain things taken to get recycled for, for their metal content or plastic content or taken to the landfill, if that's kind of like the only option, depending on what, what everything, what condition everything is in. The other thing then is also you'll you'll see that there need to be like material specific bins, which I like to talk about because people sometimes think that we can put drywall in the same bin as our regular like demo bins. And they think that we can put like brick from chimneys or exteriors into the same bin. But those things that are either like hazardous material or need to be dealt with separately, like drywall and rocks or bricks, they actually require their own separate bins. So you might see multiple bins showing up on site, or you might see specific piles of debris to be dealt with and dispersed of separately and appropriately according to what the requirements are surrounding that. And then we just kind of, we really start swinging into it. So all of these things might not necessarily apply to every individual project because it depends on what your project is. If you're doing a renovation and you're doing just your kitchen, obviously we're not necessarily going to be doing a bunch of groundwork and concrete or waterproofing. But if you're doing a major renovation or if you're building a new home, you're really going to hit all of these things. And this is really a snapshot of it. Um, but I, what I wanted to kind of illustrate here is that there's a lot going on because even within all of these like individual categories, there's, there's several groups of tasks that are involved in each of those. Like um, 
for, ex for example, like exterior openings, that's like all your exterior doors. That's all of your windows, uh, your skylights and everything kind of around that. Um, your waterproofing is going to be, it's not just like your roof and your exterior cladding. It's your whole like kind of building envelope that goes along with that, which also includes, um, for example, like blue skin or Tyvek. Um, so it includes the whole like system that's in that. And then the other thing I briefly wanted to kind of touch on here is kind of if you are having a renovation that allows you to continue living in your home, what that feels like. So in some cases, like in this project, for example, that's pictured here, this was actually a kitchen renovation. And the couple actually continued to live in the home through this renovation. So the rest of the home was dust proofed off, like shown in that, that first picture. Um, and obviously there were like safety situations that were in place for for them to kind of be aware that they're walking and going through a construction site on a regular basis and what things to be aware of um, and what things to like not get into um, when the construction team's not there and and what to ask about and all of that. So it is definitely possible to live through a renovation. Lots of people do it uh, very successfully. It, it's just about being very honest with yourself about what your what your parameters are of what you're willing to live with. Um, in this case, I believe we also set up like a temporary kitchen in their living room, which was just on the other side of this wall uh, to the right here. And so they had like a semi-functioning kitchen. They had a full bathroom. And those are really like the main things that you need in order to live through a renovation as well as like a space to sleep. So it's definitely possible. The other thing that I wanted to touch on was client site visits. So these are really important regardless of what kind of project you're taking on, because as the client and homeowner and home occupier, eventually, uh, you really want to know what's going on with your home. You don't want to feel like this project is going on and you don't know what's going on and um, that you're just, you know, paying these bills without any kind of concept of what's really happening, because there are certain stages where it may not seem like as much is going on, even though certain things are going on in the background, or, um, you want to know when the appliances are getting ordered and when those are supposed to get delivered, because that's a pretty big bill and things like that, that all kind of affect your experience of construction through that whole process and client site visits make a huge difference to that because it gives you the opportunity to have like a Q&A session. I always describe them as, you know, it's like classic essay format, what has happened, what is happening and what is coming next. It gives you the opportunity to run through like all of the finite details and have, you know, questions, comments, concerns, all of that stuff. So they're very important to everyone's experience to be able to have a smooth construction process. The next thing is changes to the scope. So there's typically kind of like two changes to the scope that occur during the course of construction. One is triggered by site conditions. What I mean by that is uh, say we open up a wall and there's water damage in a renovation. And that water damage has to be dealt with or mold or something like that. Or we open something up and there's like a fire hazard somewhere. Like those things have to be dealt with. Um, another example of um, site conditions that would apply maybe to like a larger project, like a new home would be, say we started excavation and there was just like this really massive boulder that we had to get rid of. Um, so those are things that would change the scope that are triggered by the site conditions. And there's really nothing we can do to change that other than deal with it. Uh, a good company is going to talk to you about your options and talk to you about what we can potentially do to mitigate that in the most, um, comfortable way for you. Um, and then the other version of changes to the scope are things that are triggered by client request. And so things that might be triggered by client request in a renovation, it might mean expanding your scope. Um, so sometimes people choose to add 
a, a chunk of scope that they were discussing whether or not they wanted to do it, or maybe they go over to a friend's house and they see that they redid their powder room and now they really want their powder room to be a cool showpiece too, because they're already doing the rest of their main floor. Um, so those are the kinds of triggered by client request things that you might see in a renovation, or you might see uh, where a material gets changed, which would kind of apply to both like a new home as well as a renovation where you might see um, a client changing their mind about specific details like a fireplace or what type of flooring they want to put in their project. They might decide to move from vinyl to engineered hardwood, or they might choose to move to tile for, for whatever their reasons are within their family. Um, or they might choose to change from something like, you know, a gas fireplace to an electric fireplace. And so th those are kinds of more like triggered by client request changes that might occur through the course of construction. In either case, regardless of what triggers the change, it needs to be documented properly. Uh, otherwise, it, it becomes difficult to track why the change happened and what the change was actually supposed to be. So it's really important for everybody to be able to refer back to that on a piece of paper or in an email or something that this is the change and it's been approved by both both of the parties and that everybody agreed that we were going to take on this change. And then kind of as you you come to the, the close of it all, so something that happens throughout the course of construction is like inspections and, and permit fulfillment. So a lot of larger jobs, um, basically, if you're touching over a certain amount of drywall, you're really supposed to get a permit. Uh, so if you're dealing with a permit or you're dealing with any kind of like major structural changes, you're going to have a couple of different kinds of inspections happen through the course of your project. So you'll get structural uh, inspections if those apply from your structural engineer. They'll come, they usually come and do an inspection uh, when demo's done to kind of see what the existing conditions are, especially at a reno. And then they'll come by at certain stages when certain aspects of the structure are being installed to make sure that they've been installed correctly and were, will perform as they've been specified to do. Uh, client inspections, which are kind of covered under those client visits that we were talking about. But as a client, you do inspect the work that you're going to be living in. So that that's important. Uh, and then municipal inspections, which is, you know, having the building inspectors and electrical inspectors and plumbing inspectors, like everybody coming through and walking through the project at, again, like the mo the appropriate times at the triggers um, and making sure that everything's been done according to the building code and the local municipal um, bylaws. And your, your site supervisor will go through that with them and make sure that, you know, that they're met and that they pass inspection, or if certain things need to be adjusted, that again, they're adjusted and that they pass inspection. Uh, as a homeowner, you shouldn't necessarily expect to be needing to go to all of those, all of the municipal inspections and, and structural inspections, um, although you are more than welcome to do so. Um, but your, your supervisor will manage all of that and make sure that everything goes smoothly with regards to those things. And then in with the municipal inspections, there's certain triggers for like when you close your permit and you get certain deposits back um, for certain like engineering deposits or structural deposits from the city, um, depending on what you paid up front when you got your permit with the city in order to kind of get permission to get everything going. And then once all of that is complete, everything is very happy and joyful. So we reach uh, kind of the first trigger that things are starting to wrap up is you reach substantial completion. So substantial completion is defined as 97% complete. And what that means is that the space can be used for its intended use, which means that you can cook in your kitchen and you can shower in your bathroom um, and you can live in a higher than camping standard of living, basically. You're no longer camping in your house or not able to be in your home. Uh, you can exist in it. 
there might be a few things that are incomplete or deficient, uh, such as, for example, like there might be a couple of cabinet knobs that are on back order and that are waiting for, or there might be a few paint touch-ups that are waiting to be done. Uh, but for the most part, everything is ready for use. Um, depending on the type of project that you have, you might have different kinds of warranty periods. So for new homes, there's the standard to 510 um, warranty that's that's with, uh, I think, BC Housing or, or the Canadian uh, Mortgage People, uh, CMHC. Uh, and then there's renovations, which uh, are usually self-funded by the company themselves. And so it really depends on what the company's uh, warranty period is for their work and what their standards are around that. And then also appliances and, and a few other things might have their own warranties attached to them as well. The, the other thing would be things like um, roofs and things like that. So certain products have specific warranties that are attached to their performance specifically outside of the project itself. And then, you know, even past a warranty being complete, um, most contractors really want to make sure that they maintain a really great relationship with their clients. Uh, us, personally, I can say that I we've received calls from clients well outside of their warranty period. And our priority is always to just try and make the situation right um, to the best of our ability for our clients. Um, a story that I really like to tell is, I think I we I got a call in from a client that must have been close to 10 years old at that point, like the project had been closed for 10 years and they were calling about a window that had cracked. And it was just a matter of, of you know, calling the window supplier and getting a new window in there and just trying to make it happen at the most like economic rate and as quickly as possible and, and make it happen as smoothly as possible. So um, a good contractor will want to maintain that relationship with you throughout the lifetime of your project and living in your home. So again, that's our, our recap of all the things that we went through today of, you know, everything from handing off a project into construction, going through preparing your site and pr protecting your site for construction, going into demo and hazmat remediation, all the way through executing said project and making it happen, client visits and updates to make sure that everybody knows what's going on, making sure that we document any kind of changes to the scope and making sure that everything is inspected and has been installed correctly so that all of the documentation can be fulfilled as safe and complete and the relationship of warranty and beyond that. So this would be the part where we open up for questions. If anybody has any questions, mm -hmm. um, I, I can't see if there's any hands because Michelle yeah. is aware of that. Yeah, uh, we do have more of a commenting question. So yeah. we had Ken here saying that uh, they heard recently that WorkSafe is raising the recommended age of building from the 1990 range due to foreign products that may still have hazardous materials. Yeah, no, that's uh typically uh typically we test for anything that's within a certain time period. So even if something's built in around honestly that 2000s mark or even late 90s mark, uh we do test for for materials, hazardous materials. The uh, the other thing that's recently come up is there's a an increase in lead paint testing, um like I mentioned. So Previously, the, the major concern in the Lower Mainland was asbestos-containing materials. So whether it be like the tape around ductwork or drywall or the glue and linoleum, uh, we knew where to look for asbestos and we do still look for that. And the range is widening because there was definitely like imported materials, but there was also like stocked materials on shelves that were still existing. And um, we know that a lot of that was sold past the point that it was supposed to be. Uh, the other thing is lead paint. So previously we didn't test as much for lead paint in the lower mainland because it was believed that it was not used as much. Uh, now we're starting to test for it more and we're starting to find it more in, in homes and find that it was used more than it was believed to have been used. So it's definitely 
on the radar and something that we have to account for and, and keep in mind. And if your home falls in that category or has that had work done in that category, it's definitely something that's worth having a separate budget line item for in the back of your mind. Most contractors don't want to give you a, an exact price until it gets quoted out because it really depends on where it is exactly. Um, but if you talk to your contractor, they, they, they'll they give you like a number to keep in your mind based off of previous projects. Oh, great, great. And then we had a question, more like a topic question for a future webinar, probably, uh, regarding whether we would be touching base on constructions regarding small-scale multi-unit housing, for instance, four plexes and six plexes. Um, but yeah, something that's definitely of interest and something we'll probably touch base on in a future webinar, right, Megan? <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm so glad that was mentioned because yes, that is one of the things that we are wanting to have a webinar on. Uh, we're thinking about um having it in the next few here it'll it'll be I don't want to say it'll be the next one but it'll be within the next three because we try to plan these out a few in advance and it's also a webinar that I'm hoping that I can get Henry to tag team in on so that he can be around to speak to it as well because he's involved in a lot of the councils um that discussed what the parameters are around a lot of that are so, uh, and he has tentatively agreed. So, <laughs> so yes, we'll, def we'll have to, uh, yeah, we'll definitely be on the lookout for that. And uh, we'll definitely be letting everyone know when, when that does happen. The, oh, uh, we do have another question regarding asbestos. It yep, seems, yep. it seems as though the testing is able to de detect very minute parts. How is this addressed from products that were, asbestos free when they were created uh I mean that that is less so in my like specialty house because that's something that's dealt with from the testing perspective mm -hmm. uh if it was created asbestos free but not actually asbestos free then that kind of lines up with how like a lot of that's something that infiltrates like our entire society, honestly, like that, that's a pretty big thing where um, we're told that something is safe, but it contains minute amounts of a product that it's not supposed to. And um, unfortunately, there's very little that your contractor can do about that if the testing comes back and it says that it's containing asbestos and needs to be remediated, then it kind of needs to be remediated. The other thing about asbestos is that if it's um, not disturbed, like if it's not in the air, it's not, not actually harmful. It's it's when it's in the air and you're breathing in the particles that it becomes harmful. So if something is containing asbestos, but it can be like removed as a whole pretty easily without disturbing most of it, then that's less costly than things that need to be disturbed more in order to remove it like say the glue under linoleum where you have to like scrape it up and you're basically disturbing all of it in order to remove it um so it it really depends again on where it's contained and how easily it can be removed mm -hmm. All right. And then I think there was two other questions. One was about an addition, but we might, uh, we'll probably follow up in a separate email. <laughs> um, and then we have a message here from John, which cities council meetings does Henry typically attend regarding, um, I guess, small scale multi-unit housing? Uh, yeah, I know that he's attended, uh, he's attended lots of stuff for the city of Vancouver. I know that he's also a part, he, like he attends uh, the local, like all the local Haven stuff. So the Home Builders Association of Vancouver, um, he's, he's very much a part of that. And by extension, the, the CHBA as well, and the, and the provincial levels of those. Um, so he attends all of those meetings and conversations. Uh, so those are like government meetings on the local level, provincial level and national level. He, he, uh, he's, actually going to be going to I think some national meetings here pretty soon as well mm -hmm. um, but then on top of that I know he attends a lot of meetings with like the city of Vancouver uh, I know that he's attended some for the city of Burnaby um, 
I'm sure he's he's sat in on a few other ones, but the city of Vancouver is the one that's really spearheading a lot of the regulations around them. And then a lot of municipalities are kind of piggybacking off of that. So that's where a lot of the, pardon me, a lot of the focus has been. Um, so those are the ones that just kind of come top to mind. Michelle, can, can you speak to any of the other ones that I've missed? Uh, no, definitely. Like when you mentioned the uh, city of Vancouver and city of Burnaby are primarily like the main, like they are like, leader pioneers I guess or like spearheading all this and uh but definitely I know that Henry does have like he keeps a pulse on all the different cities so definitely he's going to be a great uh, co-host when he uh joins us for a webinar <laughs> uh also actually to just add on to that quickly is that I know that the city of Kelowna was like kind of a bit of a pilot project to a lot of the bylaw stuff with the, the multiplex sort of preparation of all of that and and with doing some of their rezoning and everything and so I know mm -hmm. that he was also he also attended multiple meetings about how they changed that before it was then implemented in Vancouver so yeah he's he's very much tried to keep a pulse on it he's yeah he's definitely very active about that too and he's uh getting us as a team involved in intending and also keeping up to date right um there was one more comment from john he was curious whether tq will be at the plex appeal on september 28th the design vancouver festival um i don't I, i'm not sure i don't, I don't we don't we, we don't attend it as like a like as an exhibitor of it. Uh, I'm not sure if Henry will be going in his social calendar or if any of our designers are going in their social calendar as attendees. Mm -hmm. We attend the Vancouver Fall Home Show uh, at the Convention Center, which is happening at the end of October from the 24th to the 27th. Um, so we'll be there. Mm -hmm. And then we also do the Van Dusen Home Reno Show uh, in the spring. And then we also do the BC Home and Garden Show at um, BC Place as well. So those are our three main events that we attend. And with the Vancouver Fall Home Show, if you'd like to come and visit us, please feel free. Our design team attends. So if you'd like to ask some design questions, that's a great opportunity to kind of meet and greet the team and ask some of your questions. And we do offer tickets as well. And I think that's about it for our, all our questions here for tonight. Um, anyone else would like to ask a question here for Megan while we still have a few minutes here? <laughs> okay, I do have another question. For Even for renovation works, municipal inspections required if no structural structural changes are made? Uh, yes, if you're, it's, it's not about necessarily, it's if you're opening up a certain amount of drywall, they... It's a bit of a gray area, but if you're moving around like plumbing and electrical stuff, they want to make sure all of that is is safe. Uh, mun municipal inspections aren't just for making sure that something is structurally sound. It's making sure that it is it has like the appropriate amount of fire safety, um, that your your plumbing is done correctly, that everything has like you can exit out of the home in the event of an emergency. Um, and all of those things. So they're they're not just for structural requirements, uh, although that does play a part in it as well. They want to make sure that you're meeting all of the the other requirements as well. Okay. And then yes, that looks like if there's any other questions, feel free to ask. And if not, uh, if you come up with questions, like Megan said, uh, feel free to reach out to us and we can uh, connect with you then and help you with your project questions and your project hopefully <laughs> um and yes so thank you so much again everyone for joining us uh tonight for our webinar and feel free to as mentioned uh look out for your email uh, we will be sharing a recorded version or a copy of this webinar so um and you can review and uh go through all the different slides again what uh, megan kindly presented to us thank and you so much everyone Yes, we hope to see you next time on October 16th. Thank you.